horror stories. Were there any, uh, were there any horror stories? I, I, I only know of the one that happened to me in 19, you know, 2000, 2001. Did you experience the same thing? Well, if, if by horror story, you mean, <laughs> um, starting a company and growing it, uh, you're just fresh out of school, wet behind the ears still. And then, um, you sell your company to another company just for a share transaction, just because you thought that was a good thing because shares were going up uh, in the market and uh, the company was doing zero revenue. So when the market bust, we had to let go everybody. And then I had to find another company to hire everybody, which I did. And then six months later, that company went bust. So I had to re let go of the same people twice. Yeah. What, what, what com was them. this this uh, in trade or was this yeah. Uh, so what it was, was N -Trade. what was in trade? It was a bit like a Ariba, if you know Ariba. So a a, a procurement uh, platform that used auction as well to get people to bid on stuff. And um, you know, the idea at the time was let's build a a new auction platform for every vertical out there. So you know, you create a dot com for trading used cars, and another dot com for trucks, and another dot com for turbines i don't know and then all these dot coms would one day be worth a lot of money because people would click on it as opposed to making money out of it which made no sense right well so. i don't know if it made no sense because i'm a, you may remember this company but mark walsh was an original guy at aol he was invested in my first uh which i did was a social networking e-commerce company and he was hired to to scale a company called vertical scope do you remember vertical scope no they, i don't so they did they they basically did the exact same thing i hate to say that but uh microsoft invested a hundred million dollars in them this is during like 98 99 ish and they went public and made a bunch of money and then well, the public, I, they, they, somebody made money because it went public, but then the stock just died and, and it fizzled out and they used one vertical as the anchor, if you will. And it's sort of what I did in fishing was you use one region. And then I think we were all, okay. we were all like, Hey, let's just scale a living crap out of this. And we'll just take this template. I think what we all forgot, or I, I don't say, I don't know what you forgot or Mark forgot. I tell you what I forgot. I forgot that you got to own your home market completely and that there's probably plenty of money in that market before you go off and cover every vertical or every region around the world. Yeah. And that's a really good one. Me for me is came back to basics is like, if it looks too good to be true, probably is because it's too good to be true. Like our market cap was close to a billion dollars. And you're talking what? about like, yeah, yeah, like 2000, uh, and, uh, end of 99, early 2000, our market cap was close to a billion dollars and we almost had zero in revenue traded on the New York Stock Exchange because we had done a reverse takeover there. Made no sense, like made no sense. And I was 23 years old at the time because I had just sold my company to this company. Um, and so I had shares in there and, you know, I'd come back home and I'm like, I just made $50,000 today. I just made $100,000 today and just made no sense. Luckily enough, I had the sense in me not to kind of buy stuff and, and accumulate assets thinking that it was worth something. And when the market w started going down, which rightfully it should have, I was losing $100,000 a day, $150,000 a day. To, at the end of it all, I came out with $50,000 in my pocket, right? And so, <laughs> so that was my dot-com experience, and which gave me a very humbling experience, one, um, and also taught me to always, when you're building a company, focus on the fundamentals. So how much was the it worth? Did, I'm just curious, Mark, how much was it at, how, mu how much were you worth at your peak when that went to 50 grand? Do you think like on a high, on the highest day at one point? Maybe around 25, 30 million, you know, and I was 23 at the time, right? Well, yeah. So you're done at that point, but did you have to vest those shares? Yeah. So that's why I couldn't do anything with it. 
Yeah. I couldn't do anything with them. And so by the time I could sell them, everything had gone down and I made 50,000 bucks and I used that to go do my MBA. All right. So I was like, nobody's going to hire me. I don't have an idea, this great idea or at this point to start something new. And I wanted to travel. And uh, coming from parents, my, my dad's a French Canadian, my mom's from India. So just saying, I'm going to go travel for a year will not fly. So like, I'll go do my MBA abroad. So I went and did that for a year and I learned so much during that year. It was great. So here's a question, because I feel like a lot of people that I know from that era where we all 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, the crash happened. We got an incredible education. And then we all went to business school because I did, I I didn't go abroad. I did an international program, but I I went to UNC Chapel Hill here in the States. And why did, why did we all like, was that the era where, I don't know. I, I remember back, I did it because a VC told me I went in, I became a venture capitalist. I worked at a VC firm and they told me at the time, like, Hey, listen, kid, if you don't get your MBA, like you're never going to do this. And I'm like, well, what if I just make money? And I'm like, yeah, you need your MBA. And, and, and these guys are super smart. They're st- I still stay in touch. I'm eternally grateful. These were Harvard MBAs. And they're like, hey, you got to get a top 20 MBA or you're not going to cut it. What do you think it, like, what, why did we do that after we just got all that business experience? For me, I can tell you for me, it was two things. One is I needed a break. I needed to kind of reflect of what this craziness had just happened. I also wanted to learn the basics of finance and accounting, which I knew nothing about. I was more on the tech side. I was more building sites and managing R&D teams and all that. And that part of the business, I didn't understand. And that's what, had I understood it better, maybe things would have gone differently. Um, And so I wanted to kind of learn that. And at the same time, I wanted to travel. So I just wanted to take a break. I was 23. I had just been studying and working my, you know, (laughs) all up till then so um so yeah so that's why i did it um and honestly i think it was one of the if you look at it as a full year for me it was probably the most enriching full year of my life because i ended up going to do my mba at insead i don't know if you know insead i do it's a top uh, international business school yeah and it has a campus in singapore and uh you're in a class of like 60 students of 40 different nationalities. And you've got someone from Indonesia, someone from Pakistan, someone from all the countries in Europe and North America and Latin America and Africa. And you're just learning so much from all of them. And all of them are from different backgrounds. Some, some are from Fortune 100, consulting firms, finance, all that stuff. And you're learning, learning, learning so much from all of them, more than you are from the actual class itself. And so for me, that was just so enriching. And then I got to do a couple of months on the campus in France. And then I also did did the exchange program with Wharton. So just got that full year of just soaking things in and learning a lot. And when it all ended, I came back and said, you know what? I just love startups. Like, you know, after being exposed to all these different things, I was like, I just love startups. So that's kind of where I decided to spend more of my time on. I think one of the revelations really is what you said, and it sparked a memory that I remember before I was agreed to go to good business school, so to speak, the partners in that firm said, hey, you need to go take classes. And I took classes at one of the local colleges on accounting and finance. And over the years, I think the whole business sits in the spreadsheet. Would you agree? Or I would say the whole business sits between the lines of the spreadsheet. That's, better, yeah. <laughs> That's a more thoughtful yeah. answer for the, 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 than, than I gave. But I agree. Like it is, that's where it happens. And people focus on the brand and the product and all that, which is absolutely, like may, may, make no mistake, but that is represented in that spreadsheet or worksheet or whatever you, you call it through multiple tabs. It's just not a simple p and I mean. Yeah, I think to a certain extent, but I think, you know, there's also that little magic that happens when you get the right people together, which will change sometimes the direction of different companies. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of what Steve Jobs does. And if you just looked at the spreadsheet before he 
rejoined Apple, you wouldn't have thought that that's where it would end up being as a company today, right? So sometimes you you do have to have that insight, that vision, and that catalyst to bring things together to change the direction of things, and which is not easy. Um, and so I think it's it's a balance of what you can see in the spreadsheet and what's not, but understanding the mechanics and understanding how to read this is so important um, to stay true to building a company based on fundamentals. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think thinking about it, um, I, I tend to focus on the money maybe because I have a scar from running out of money and then I bought, <laughs> yeah. then, then I bought the company back and then it, it worked out. But the, the first time I saw a lawyer, this guy, Harry Glazier, he worked for GT Law in Northern Virginia, which was the big tech law firm back then at the time and Cooley was coming up and actually Mike Lincoln eventually became my lawyer. But Harry said, he's like, kid, I got one piece of advice for you. That's it. And I just, just, this is it. He's like, don't run it. Don't run out of effing money. And I was like, and then I started to really realize that, you know, the P and L is different than cash flow. And I think for me running an e-commerce sure. site at the time, and, and you, maybe you were running a SAS, but, um, Cash flow, just because you have a credit card doesn't mean that the money is going to come on the 30th because the credit cards are going to hold the money back. And now you're going to find yourself where you think you're hugely profitable. I think that was a lesson for me that is really just struck with me. And my, sometimes my brother says, he's like, you're always in the spreadsheet. I'm like, I'm in the spreadsheet just to know if it can possibly work. And if it does work, what it looks like. So uh, that's definitely a scar for me, but I absolutely think you're right. I mean, you, the spreadsheet doesn't work without the right team. How do you select team members? I'm really bad at making good hires, but I'm so, so let's, if you look at my hit rate, like when I, when I bring, or when we bring someone on board on a team, I may be a 50% hit rate as to whether uh, it's the right fit. I, I, I don't know how people do a really good job at interviewing. I have never figured that out yet. Um, but what I do do, though, is that I recognize it really quickly within a couple, oh, maybe even a week to two weeks, you can recognize whether someone's a good fit and kind of they have the right attitude. Because someone in an interview can say whatever they want, but, it, it, you know, the proof points are there. And so within a couple of weeks, you can, you can see it very well, and then you make the change right away. Um, but then if they're good, I do everything in my power to keep them as long as it makes sense for both the company and, and the person. Um, that's how I look at team members. And, and then it's really building a, a relationship of trust, really. Like if, if you trust what they're doing, you're not there to oversee or else there's no point of bringing in someone else. You might as well do it yourself. And so you trust what they do. And sometimes they may disagree with or you may disagree with the direction, but maybe they're onto something. So you kind of let it go along, but then you also have to have a culture within the organization to say, Hey, let's change cap. If we know we're making mistakes. So I'll make many mistakes. And in, in when I, when I build a business, but I'll change directions pretty quickly. If I realize that I made a mistake and having that is, I think how you look at bringing in team members that have a very similar approach. Do you find it hard to let the people go? Um, emotionally hard, but tactically not hard. Like I will let people go and I've let friends go. I've let, um, you know, people that I've worked with for 10 years. And at one point it didn't make sense anymore. And we had to part ways, but I think it's done in respect. And they, they've seen, they've seen also how I've operated in the past. And they know each time I had to let go someone or I decided to let go someone, it was for the right reason. So when it comes to them, they're like, yeah, okay, there's, there's, there's some reasons behind it. And it's always done in respect. So I do let go, but, um, the night before I never sleep well. Yeah. I think it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I, I, I remember doing that dot com since we were talking about it. I think I delayed it. The board member called me every day. Chairman, is it over? I was like, no, it's not like, I can't do this. This is, these are, Yes, it's the right thing to do for the business, but these people are humans. I think it took me like four days, Mark. But um, so, but you know, it's interesting because I there's two two 
two um, two ways or two reasons you let go of people. Sometimes it's about performance or fit, and and or you know the trajectory of the company doesn't match the individual. That one is one that is not too hard. The one that I found really really hard is when you have to let go a lot of people, and it's not necessarily their fault. It's because the company made a bad decision, either hiring too much or spending too much or trying something. That is extremely hard. And during the dot-com days, that I, that's what I experienced twice, right? I had to let go of my team that I had built twice. Um, and um, yeah, it's not something that I ever want to do again. I think that, um, that, that's a good distinction. And I think maybe that's why it was pain. I, I will agree when someone sucks or they are not a race fit, uh, it, it's a money thing at that point. But I still mm-hmm. have this thing like, oh man, like they're still human. They're still going to, you know, they may have, sometimes they do know. Sometimes we all know, but no one says anything and eventually you do. But I think they're still human. So it's hard. But get, getting back to your story, you start a company out of college you sell it for stock. You basically are worth like 25 million. You get 50,000 out of it at the end. You go to business school to learn sort of the fundamentals and do some traveling and get some international mm-hmm. exposure. What do you do when you come back? So I knew I wanted to go back into the startup world, but I didn't have an idea of what to do as a business. And so I figured, you know what, let me try to apply as much as I've learned from my MBA um, by joining a VC fund. Um, and so if you're a VC fund in Canada in 2000 and what was it? 2002, at the end of 2002, you got my resume and you got an email from me. Every partner of every VC fund in Canada got my profile. Um, because my intention was let's join a VC fund. I'll get to see what's out there. I'll get exposed. I'll be ex- able to apply some of the stuff that I, I may have learned during my MBA and maybe an idea will spark from there and then I'll have some more connections and, you know, life will be great. So I applied to, or I sent my resume. There was no, no even openings. I would just send my, my profile to everybody and say, Hey, I'm looking for something. If there's anything. Luckily enough, there was two funds that had some openings and I joined one of them in Montreal. And so I worked as a VC for about two years, a bit less than two years. Um, And it was interesting because uh, it was a government funded fund. Um, So it was not this traditional partners and analysts and stuff. It was an evergreen fund that the group, Quebec of government called the Novotech had put in place to invest in companies to help economic development. And when I joined in 2003, there was this cemetery of companies that they had invested in that they just still own equity in, but these companies were going nowhere because the dot-com thing had busted. And, And so coming in, I was this young dude, just finished my MBA, one startup behind <laughs> below my belt. And which was not the most successful experience there. But then they said, you know what? Here's nine companies in our portfolio. They're yours. You can do whatever you want with them as long as we don't have to put money in them because we already wrote them off. So do whatever you want with them. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I got to sit on those boards. I had no reason to be on those boards because I didn't have the experience or the, the, the know-how to be able to do that. But I learned so much about board dynamics I learned about um, uh, the CEOs and the, the the problems that they were going through. Some were good CEOs, some weren't good CEOs. Uh, we divested a bunch of companies. We merged some companies. We sold some companies. Um, and so just that two years of dealing with these cemetery of companies was such a great learning experience for me of what are the reasons why companies don't succeed from a board um perspective. Um, and, uh, that toolbox was so important moving forward for the startups that I eventually end up doing. What lessons did you learn from being on the board of why they do fail? 
Um, I think one of the main reasons why companies fail is, you know, people talk about lack of cash, but ultimately it's lack of alignment. Um, if your board members, the founders, the employees are not aligned, things goes to shit, right? Like really, because what happens, think about, just look at the founder situation. If one founder wants to go right and the other founder wants to go left, things will explode, right? At one point, there's going to be some shakeout and someone's going to have to, to leave or something. And that is a disruption for a startup. Now, if you've got misalignment between board members, well, maybe you need the cash, but the board members are not aligned of how to or where you should get the money from, or even if you should raise money, or if you should do this and that. So misalignment there is a cause, again, of why companies fail. Same thing with employees. If founders feel they need to, they want to go in, in a direction, and employees want to go in a different direction, again, misalignment is, one to me, one of the reasons why companies fail. Uh, one of the main reasons that, at least at the board level, you can start understanding very well. So as I built my other startups after that, one of the things that I always tried to do is making sure that my board members, at least the executive as well, are always aligned of what we're trying to do. And if we're not aligned, let's battle it out. Let's talk it out until we do have alignment, uh, because that to me is fundamental. Do you think that investors that sit on startup boards are actually ever really aligned? And here, here, here's why. Having been a VC like you and having been an entrepreneur sat on both sides of the table, what I found is the investors, and this is not bad. Like if you read online and entrepreneurs always beat up on VCs and this, that, and the others, like VCs have a fiduciary responsibility to their limited partners to make money, period. They market that they care and they are going to help you build it. Of course they are if they invest. They, they want that to go, they need 100x. I mean, this is just a, it's a math equation here. They got 10 investments. They need one to hit 100x, make their fund or two, which would be a really good fund, maybe in like the top 99%. So when they sit on your board, and I, I experienced this, I don't know about you, firsthand, and even when I was a VC and had, I, I wasn't always, I was, um, I had we had always had observer rights, so I would sit in on those meetings. We were making decisions that were good to make money. There's a big difference between building a company and making money. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. In fact, like we talked about vertical scope earlier, Mark, the business didn't make it, but a lot of people made a lot of money. That might be success. So there's this philosophical thing like, well, it didn't really work. Well, I don't know. It depends on what you say. If you put $50 million in your pocket, I'd say it worked uh, in one sense. So there's this difference between making money and building a company. And what I felt like, and I still do today, is that the, 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 you're never truly aligned. You know, one of the biggest examples that I think fought that was Jeff Bezos. And I know he gets talked about a lot. But his vision was always 10, 15 years. And you, you see some of the people who have been able to push back on investors. I was actually just watching YouTube the other day with a guy who was pushing him in an early interview, like, hey, your quarter isn't good. Your next quarter. He's like, I don't care. It's not about next quarter. We could fail, but it's, it's about the next 10 years. And I started, Mark, to put non-investors on my board and wouldn't let them invest because they were more aligned with the genuine thing that people like you and I might want to do. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's a very valid point that you make. Um, so let's, let's maybe take a step back. Cause I think th there's a lot in there that you talked about. Um, first is finding the right investors. Um, you know, I've been, I've pitched some of my startups and gotten venture funding and I had some VCs that were interested in, in investing, but their vision of where the company should go was very different from how I saw things would happen. And so 
went with a different firm. So I'll give you an example, like one, so Tungle, which was a scheduling platform precursor to Calendly, which is uh, one of the startups that I did uh, a few decades ago. Um, the, uh, when I was raising my series A, I was still pre-revenue and I wasn't planning to bring in revenue for a while because it was about virality, user growth, and really capture the market. Uh, and we can talk why that was my vision, but, but, but that's beside the point here. So that was really where I wanted to do. And then when I was doing my series A, I was talking to some of the VCs and they're like, Hey, well, how are you going to make money? I'm like, here's how I intend to make money but I am not going to be making money for the next two years or three years. And they're like, no, but you should be bringing that forward because you can, you do have some metrics to do that. I'm like, yes, but that's going to be at the detriment of viral growth. And I don't want to do that. I want to focus on growth first. Well, when I was talking to other VCs, they understood that. Um, and I went with these other VCs, even though the valuation that they were giving me was a bit lower because at least we were aligned with where we should be bringing the company. So that's one of the first thing is trying to find the right partners around the table that subscribe to the same vision, at least when you have it, because the vision and, and direction can change as you learn and you get more data. Now, the second part is now, once you're around the table with these individuals, things can start misaligning at one point and they will, and they always will. And I'll, you know, the other startup that I had after, which was FOCO, I uh, had a board and we were building this uh, retail task management and communication platform. And this one board member, which was representing one of the funds, every time I would say, hey, here's where I think we should go, he would always give a reason not to do it. Every single time at every single board, every single board, I'd say, here's what I think we should be doing for the next three months. He's like, no, I think you should be doing this. And it was always this big argument. And we were five at the board table and four were saying this, and he always had this. And I was like, what's going on? Like, why is, is he always the contrarian here? And so at one point I'm like, I need to meet with you. Like we need to have this conversation. Uh, and so we met in person and it's someone that I respected a lot, but it was always this contrarian thing. And I was like, um, and I won't say his name, so Bob, we'll call him Bob. Bob, why are you always telling me the opposite of what I want to do? And he looked at me, he's like, well, that's my job. I'm like, what do you mean that's your job? And he's like, well, because you're really good at convincing everybody that we should be doing something. My job is to try to make people think of other things around the table. And I'm like, okay, so sometimes you do agree. You're just trying to be the devil's advocate. And he's like, yeah, because we need to have this conversation or else it's just going to be unanimously decided. And I'm like, oh, but once I understood that, I started embracing it during the board. So I'd be like, all right, Bob, um, you know, why are the reasons we shouldn't be doing this? And then he'd give his reasons and then we would debate it out. And like, but, but when I had this one-on-one -on -one with him, I did end up saying, listen, you can be the contrary, and I actually applaud that. I think it's important to have that around the table so that we're actually debating things. But ultimately, at the end, I need you to say to everybody, all right, we've made a decision. I agree with it. Let's move on, right? And because I don't want you two years from now to say, I told you so, right? We're agreeing on these things together, and he agreed. And so we kind of figure out a new way of operating together. And, and from there, it actually helped the company a lot, but we needed to have this understanding between each other of how to operate. And so again, alignment is something you work on. It's not something that happens all the time. Um, and sometimes if you really have diverging, you got to part ways. So you know what? It's not working. You think we should be doing this. This is that you're hard on your way. I'm hard on mine. One of us has got to go. So let's make the call because our else is going to self-destroy anyways. So I don't like slow death and might as well kill it. When you say kill it, would you take you part the, ways? I mean, part right. ways, meaning do you figure out how to buy out the investor? Yeah. Do you think that that should be? So I had to do that too. The investor was really mad. I just, I, I just was a, was a case where we were just, there's just egos. Like, I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you want to do a startup, man. And you don't have an, and somebody says you don't have an ego. Like, you got to have an ego in this business, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because you get beat to hell on a regular basis. And I am taking some responsibility 
for what it was. But fundamentally, I was the guy who was running the company and had the vision. And I was like, hey, listen, Bob, this isn't going to work. He's like, no, you 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 can't buy me out. And I was like, and it it was a disruption to the company, Mark. Um, mm-hmm. Have you done that before? Um, not with investors, but co-founders. I did it with a co-founder too. That was it, yeah. That was hard. But the way the way you know the way I usually structure the companies is it's my house, and then if it doesn't work out, here are terms that we know we're going to get divorced on already. So it's already preset, right? So you so do. So you set that out. That's not mm-hmm. common. No. How, yeah. so you just have some terms in the actual deal docs or the share safe, purchase safe, agreement and all that safe stuff. Or yeah. whatever else. Yeah, totally. So could you share it? I mean, do you guarantee a return or do you do a dividend? How do you get them out in, because let's say your current company block, which we're going to talk about, but it is worth a billion dollars. You and another investor don't get along. They were in, in say the A round and they're and they on paper are worth make it up fifty million dollars, but the deal like the deal terms say that mm-hmm. they get their investment plus eight percent dividend or ten percent. How do you do? What term do you use? I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm never, asking for myself. By the yeah, way. yeah, so I've never done it at that scale. So you know, my companies have never been worth a billion. Hopefully, this one will. Um, um, but in 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 the way that I like to structure things, let's say with with say co-founders is they can they can uh let's say we we part ways one is who gets to decide right so let's say i'm the ceo or i'm the majority shareholder so if one day i decide that the the co-founder is not the right person that person can leave right um i can ask that person to leave so stop being in or in an executive role or in a role within the company and then um, there's two choices. They can try to sell their shares at a certain price uh, that's that's fair market value uh, if they want to. They can decide to keep it, but all the voting rights go into a trust that's managed by the board. Um, so they don't have any voting rights anymore, so they can still keep their equity. Or there can be an offer to, to acquire the shares should the uh, founder decide that they, uh, they, uh, they want to accept that offer. So that's typically how I would do it with co-founders. With investors, that's a bit more complicated, especially VCs, uh, for sure. Uh, and that's typically more around uh, board management than anything else, right? How, what's the board composition? Who, who, uh, who gets voting right on what? I think that's a, a fair assessment. I think the thing that pains me the most is, and I have co-founders leave, is they still have the equity. Yeah, sure, they don't have voting rights because that was the terms. But they're like riding along for the ride and you're still in the fight. I don't know. Something rubs me the wrong way with that, Mark. How about you? Yeah, it does. <laughs> but it is, it is part of life. It is part of life. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're talking a lot about the protecting the downside. Uh, or But oftentimes it's how do you maximize the the upsides and the relationship that you've got with people, you know, if, if you are going to co-found a company with someone like it, it's a, it's a marriage. So there's a lot of give and take. Um, and hopefully you get with the right people so that you build something very more powerful and, and, and something that's going to be worth a lot more together. Um, and there's a lot of conversations to be had. So I'm, you know, I'm less draconian that, that the documents make it look like, it's more about working with your team, understanding um, and and having debating things out so that the best solution comes out. And oftentimes it's not mine. Right. So I, I think there's a core lesson that goes back to your story with Bob is you were having all these board meetings. How long do you think that went on before you had that talk? About three board meetings. So six months, six months. That's a long time, especially in a startup. Mm-hmm. It all comes down to human interaction and communication. Yeah, totally. Like this isn't totally. math. This isn't math. We talked about spreadsheets. Like this has nothing to do with any of that. Absolutely not. It's just it's, it's really humans, right? We're we're humans. We're trying to do and and I I always start with the premise that people are of good faith, and 
understanding what are their motivations and for them to understand your motivations go a long way in coming up with a resolution. And to me, that is the most rewarding part of working with people. When you, there is misunderstanding, but you can resolve things to me, then you're much stronger from that. Um, sometimes it can, but most of the times I think it can, if, if you really work from, from that aspect. Yeah. I think you have to make yourself vulnerable and mm -hmm. push your cards onto the table. And if you don't, then there will, 100%. There, there will be that. You use the word motivation. I use the word incentive. If you want to know why behaviors happen and just understand how they're incentivized, like, which yeah. is the same thing as motivation. Like, and, and call it out, right? Call it out in both ways. Like, the reason why I want to do this is X, Y, Z. The reason why you want to do this is that. All right. We, we know it. Now, how do we go about figuring out a way that it'll work? Um, because it, it, it's really, to me, that's almost like checking your ego apart and saying, yeah, it's true. But that's what's my motivation right now. Um, so, I don't know. I think one of the tools I use, and then we'll move on to what happened after you, you went to this, the, the VC firm after you graduated mm -hmm. from your MBA is I used this the other day because it was, we were in a discussion around a contract and it was escalating. Like, you, you know, when that happens and there's mm -hmm. things that aren't being said. And I just finally said, and I caught myself because look, I'm, I'm no angel <laughs> when it happens to that. I was like, what's your concern? And then shut up. And it came out and this guy says, well, here's my concern. No problem. Let's write something in there to address that specific concern. And here's what we'll do to at least acknowledge and de-risk it as much as we can for you. Mm -hmm. From that moment, it went from this, this rapid rise, basically that. like all the way down to normal. And then we had, then three minutes later, we're talking about riding bikes. <laughs> I had this, uh, I had this mentor that told me once, he's like, Mark, you never negotiate terms of a contract. You negotiate the principle behind the contract. Once you've got the principle laid out, the terms come easy, right? And that comes to the, what you were saying, right? Really, what, what's the core problem here? And so if you understand that, then you can figure out the terms. That's the easy part. Yeah, humans are, it's crazy. Uh, it, did you find it with those when you were in the VC firm and you were managing these other nine companies that you could basically mm -hmm. do? Most, would you say 90% of the issues there were human dynamic? Or was there, you know, th there's always product market, quote unquote, fit crap. But. Mm -hmm. It's all about people. It was really all about people. And it was interesting, the egos, mine included, you know, 25 years old or 26, oh, I was older, 27. At the time, the egos around the table, um, people representing different funds, people, and then you're on the same file because Montreal and Quebec is a small playing so you're you're you basically take swap a few board members and <laughs> you're in a different company and so if you did something wrong to someone on one one deal with it, it would show up on the next one and it was just interesting interesting to understand all this dynamic component of it um but then there was also a lot of support once in a while right it's like hey we went through this together on this deal and uh we were able to build trust. And so we trust each other as we go along on other uh, deals. So, you know, you, you get, you get these relationship of, of individuals that you have and people that I've worked with 20 years ago, that there's this, there's this fundamental trust that was built between us that we will tell each other whatever we need to say um, when it comes down to working with companies or, or, opinions on founders or opinions on, on the market or whatever. And yeah, it's just at one point it becomes very valuable. So now you're at this VC firm, which is a state economic type mm -hmm. fund. You have these nine mm -hmm. companies. Why do you leave or what makes you leave? Because I think the next stop is Tungle, which was a no, no, it wasn't. Oh, no, it just it goes to yeah. show how much I did research. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, it, it was close though. But uh, no, so so I ended up um, being able to do one new investment, 
uh, which was a company in Ottawa called Nimcat Networks, which was in the voice over IP space. So that was in, call it 2004. Um, Skype was really just starting um, at that time. And, um, um, and so I really built a really good rapport with the founders of that company, ended up investing in the company through the fund. Um, and uh, six months, nine months after investing in that company, the itch was there. I really liked what they were up to, got along with the founders really well. They needed someone to really look at business development and sales and marketing for that company. Um, and so I jumped ship and went back into the startup world, but not as a founder, as um, the person responsible for the go-to-market. How'd that feel? Uh, in terms of not being the founder? Yeah. Or, fine. You know, I looked at it as a learning. I was being paid to learn. Because my first startup during the dot-com, I was more on the technical side, managing R&D team, blah, blah, blah. Then I had done a lot more of the finance and and board dynamics and that stuff as a VC. And I really wanted to learn a lot more about the go-to-market part of it. So I was actually being paid <laughs> to learn. Um, and I had a good mentor and the CEO. And and so uh, we worked on that business. And what was it? About 18 to 24 months later, we sold the company to Avaya. Um, so Avaya, the voice over IP, uh, the, the telecom. Um, and... Uh, Learned a lot through that process. So it was great. So when they acquire the company, do you have to go and go work for them for some period of time? Yeah, they wanted me to, uh, you know, they, they, they offered me to stay with the company, but I, just, I said I just wanted to stay with, for the transition. Uh, so I stayed for three months, helped them do the transition, and then found it Tungle. Well, there has to be some, like, did you already have this idea that you were going to go into the calendar space. You were doing some interesting thing around harvesting information suggestions. It was early on sort of mm -hmm. machine learning AI sort of time frame back then. So, you know, every startup that I've been involved with start in one direction and ends up going somewhere else. That was a classic case of that. So Nimcat, the company that was acquired by Avaya was building this peer to peer voice uh, system uh, for offices. So typically, if you think about this, the traditional phone infrastructure in a business, you've got the PBX, which is the server, and then you have the phones, which were terminals connecting to that server, the PBX that would then connect to the phone lines externally. And what uh, Nimcat had built was a peer-to-peer -peer phone system for the office. You didn't need that PBX anymore. Right, so it would work peer to peer within the, the company, and then it, there would be a little gateway that would connect to the phone lines outside. Um, and so when I started, um, uh, which what became Tungle, the idea was to build a peer to peer exchange server. Because when you looked at businesses back then, you had the exchange server that you needed to set up, and then people had their computers were connecting to the exchange server. And I was like, this is so complicated when you think about how this whole system, what if we could just install something on a software on each other computers and peer to peer, they would connect to each other and you wouldn't need this exchange server because everything was still on premise back in the day, right? And then you could connect out to the internet if you wanted to. And so the idea was to start with a peer to peer exchange server. So that's how the company started. But then as you start looking into how you're gonna build it, you try to figure out what's the first thing you need to build and doing research and talking to a lot of companies and all that came to the realization that people usually make the decision to use an exchange server the day they need to share calendars because the company becomes big enough that they need to start seeing when other people are free within the company. So they install an exchange server and that's kind of the, the driver of installing an exchange server. So I was like, okay, well, why don't we start with calendar sharing within a company? Hey, that it seems like the easiest way to start as opposed to building the whole mail infrastructure and doing all that stuff. So again, investigate it and again, talk to a lot more people out there. And people were like, yeah, um, 
exchange uh, a peer to peer exchange or, uh, sorry a peer to peer calendar would be pretty cool but why limit it to my company can't if you're going to go peer to peer can't you share can i start sharing my calendar with anybody that i want i was like oh that's kind of interesting and at that same time google was starting to build their calendar online and so i was starting to look at that i'm like oh that kind of sucks because they're going to into the the sharing of calendar with whoever you want and so but then again talking to a lot of people and then they were starting to say well i don't want to share my calendar with everybody but i want to meet with a lot of people is there a way for me to start scheduling meetings with people where i can show just parts of my calendar to people so that they can find a time to meet with me i was like oh that's kind of interesting and that's how tungle really started so it was a lot of conversation but like i said it never started with that as a full idea it was hey let's build a peer-to-peer -peer exchange server which then morphed into um what became a precursor to calendly did you raise money right out of the gate or did you sort of use your own money until you figured it out how did that or and why did you decide to raise money so when i first started started tungle um when we sold nimcat i wasn't the founder or anything but i had some options so i made a good whopping hundred thousand dollars Right after my MBA, that's I had still spent a lot the, of money. That's still uh, a lot of money know, to a lot of people. I mean, we're laughing, yeah. but that, that's a lot of that's six yeah. figures. Yeah, yeah, it was my my full of all my assets, and so I took fifty thousand dollars of it, put it in Tungle, um, and then another fifty thousand I bought a condo as a down payment for a condo. Um, so that was how I spent that hundred thousand bucks, and then. Uh, two friends also put in a little bit of money each, uh, 25000 each. So that was a total of 100000 And with some government grants, I got another 100000 Uh Canada is really good for R&D government grants. And so total of $200,000, that's how I start to hire first few people um, and start to build kind of the core technology there. Um, until we had something that was more of a product. Uh, and then I did a, a, a seed round of how much was it? Uh, like a million and a half, I think. A million, one point two, one point five. Can't remember. You you seem to that your story so far is very much around. You, you've raised yeah. money for these things. Have you ever thought about bootstrapping and just going that route, or are you a believer in sort of the venture model? in that sense. I mean, there's, there's some camps now, I don't think it was so much back then, uh, Mark, but now there's these really divided camps that I see where they're like, Oh, well you took money. So you're, you sold out or something And these bootstrap companies really pride themselves, which is really hard. Like mm -hmm. it, it is, mm -hmm. I'm bootstrapping one now and trying to fight the urge, but, um, did, what like went through your head? Was that even an option or were you just going down that route? Um, I've come, I've come up, I'm kind of a hybrid when it comes to that. Um, so uh, my mindset is very different now, but we'll go back to when I started Tungle. What I found fascinating in the venture world was that a guy that was like 27 or whatever could raise money if it had the right idea, the right team, the right Blah, blah, which is not easy to raise money, but if you could raise money from venture, you could pay yourself a decent salary, not an extravagant salary, but a decent salary for someone that doesn't have coffers, it's, it, you, you, you do well, and you still have the whole upside if you do sell your company. You know, like if you do sell your company one day, you've got the whole upside of all the equity that you you had when you started a company. So to me, that was like kind of a, a bit of a life hack, which was why struggle to that extent if you can build something, uh, raise some funding, um, pay yourself and not, not extravagant, pay yourself and pay your employees and, and build something. And then you still have a good potential of the upside of a successful exit. So at that time, that was kind of my reasoning and in going into fundraising, not necessarily knowing all the other issues that could follow from there, but that was, was like, Hey, this is kind of a little bit of a hack that you can build something pretty good and have a decent living. 
not knowing that if you're not successful, your ability to raise in the future might be harder and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, naive, you are what you are and you take the decisions and luckily it worked out for me. But, um, but yeah, so that was my decision back then. Um, now, um, having done it a few times, um, I think that if you've got an opportunity in the market that you want to go after, it, I think it's okay to raise some seed money um, to be able to really test it out with the right people around the table. Um, but before you go out and raise the larger and larger checks, call it 3 million and above, in, in my SaaS world, like if you're in chips and all that, it's a much different world, but in, in the software world, um, you need to have very solid business fundamentals and proof points to be able to do that. Some people do it. Even during the heydays, I was seeing people doing it and they didn't have the fundamentals. I'm like, this is not going to end well for them. Like it, there's no way it's going to end well for them. So to me, it's like, I think it's okay to, to have a pool of money to really test something out and build something as a fundamental. But once, but you really got to be able to prove it out before you go and raise a lot more money uh, to, to really blow it out of the water. And for listeners who may not understand the nuance of what you said when you said you saw these other founders who raised money and didn't work out, that can mean that the company actually did work, but when they did get a chance to participate in the upside, the cap table was such that they actually didn't have a lot. I mean, I know some founders who did swing for the fence, companies worth a decent amount, a few hundred million, and at the end of the day, they own 5%. Now. 5% of, you know, $700 million is still a lot of money. However, that, that didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And to your point, you get paid okay, but there's comps on all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and there's some VCs who are going to say, well, you can't get your market value. I mean, period. Mm -hmm. So you, you do have an opportunity cost there, but I, I just want to point that out for people because I think people would be really shocked. Um, I remember looking at box.com mm -hmm. with Aaron and I, I just knew the financers through their series and rounds and I had some inside information. And then when I read their SEC filing, I think when they went public, he owned 6% and you're like, 6%. Now, someone like Mark Zuckerberg managed to keep way, I mean, I, he was mm -hmm. 50 plus percent. But his growth trajectory was very, very different. different. And that's a consumer product, not a SaaS business and yada, yada, but, or a, a B2B product. So I just wanted to mention that for listeners. Do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. Um, and, and also on valuation, like you don't want to be chasing valuation. Like when you're looking about a year ago and I was looking at the valuation, like this makes no sense right now. And even though I could have, because for for the company blocks that that I'm um, part of with an awesome team right now, we did raise 1.5 million of friends and family kind of round, and we could have if we looked at the market because we raised it a year ago, we could have raised it at a much higher valuation, uh, but we didn't because to me it made no financial sense because I knew that the market would not hold, and the day that it does go down. Now try to raise again at the same valuation. If not, then what's going to happen? Misalignment. The investors that put in money earlier will be pissed off and all that. And I was like, this is not, this doesn't make sense. So we raised it at what we believe is the reasonable valuation, which was lower than what market would have dictated. But now we're in a position that the day that we do go for a seed or a series A or whatever you want to call it, the valuation will make sense for everybody. Right. I I 100% agree. I have a friend who, uh, Tig Savage, who is a partner over at Revolution, and we've known each other since America Online days when, when mm -hmm. I had worked in marketing. He was a VC there, and now Revolution is Steve Case Company, but, um, and fund. But Tig runs the the growth fund and is really the main founder co-founder there. But he has always argued on fishing trips, dinners, and all the things like you should take the lower valuation. And I'm always like, yeah, of course, because you're incentivized to do that because you get more of the equity. But there is, that's the founder in me trying mm -hmm. to get as much as you can. But the truth is what you just said is a very thoughtful 
laid out thing. Because if you have to do a down round, I don't think most people understand that that the consequences and the ratchets that are written in there, and not to mention now your momentum is is just a mess. And mm -hmm. um, so and that, alignment, that, and this is where alignment goes out of whack. Yeah, and all hell breaks loose, and you could actually have a decent product. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, totally. So let's go back to Tongo real quick because you get that going. You put in about a you get, you and your friends put in a hundred grand, get a hundred thousand dollar grant from the Canadian government, which is incredible in R and D credits, which mm -hmm. is a whole different podcast unto itself. But then ultimately, you grow that company and you sell it to. Yeah. So before even selling, we did raise. Uh, a seed round of 1.5 ish and then another series a of 5 million um wow. how many years and, so we so started the company in 2006 the 1.5 was in 2007 and the 5 million was in 2009 so you had yeah. a few year few year run at this thing you, yeah you, yeah I, and then in 2011 so we grew it to about half a million users all viral and it was, was a, a beautiful experience. And then, um, and then Blackberry came knocking at the door in 2011. Um, it was the right fit and we sold. And when I say it's the right fit, timing is everything. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about it's the right financial thing for the business. It's the right, uh, market condition, blah, 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 which all those things are true. But ultimately, it comes down to founder incentive. And my incentive was really interesting at that point where my wife was pregnant. I was traveling a lot. You know, I was on the road all, all the time, going to conferences, meeting with customers, doing, you know, doing all this stuff, partnerships, all that stuff. And I was like, looking back and I was saying, I don't want to be an absentee dad. I want to be at home. My wife is pregnant. She's going to have a kid. Blackberry comes knocking at the table, a way to secure my comp my family financially as well. Um, and the timing was right for the business as well. Um, we either had to go into fundraising or exit, you know? And so when all that was put together, like, yeah, the price is right, the, the, the right company. And also at the time, I was kind of excited to join Blackberry because... It still had a chance. It still had a chance back in 2011. You know, it was it had to be a fighting chance, but it still had a chance. And so I was looking at that, saying, "Hey, let's let's do the deal," and we did it, and um, then worked for BlackBerry for two years there, which is a great exit. Mm -hmm. I still miss my BlackBerry. To be quite honest, I went on eBay just like two weeks ago looking for one. I, I just like the keyboard. Call me old school. I don't care, man. That thing was cool. Um, Can I tell you a story about the keyboard? Yeah. So I'm a year in at BlackBerry. <clears throat> at that point, um, I'm responsible for what they call the PIM. So the calendar, the email, contacts, task, and memo from a product management and R&D perspective. Um, when you think about the BlackBerry, that's kind of core to their software, right? Um, and to compete with Apple, uh, we were coming out with our new OS. We the BlackBerry had bought QNX, if you remember, um, great operating system. And the idea was to bring that operating system on the phone so that it would be a lot more tactile and all that great stuff. And so my team's responsibility was to build the PIM, again, calendar, contacts, email, task memo for this BB10, the BlackBerry 10, which was the new operating system. So I'm sitting in this boardroom and they're showing, so I'm part of the software team, there's a hardware team. And so they're showing the new phone up, the new phone where the new BB10 is gonna be launched. And I'm with some directors and vice presidents. And, and so I'm looking at the, the image of the phone and everybody's like, wow, it looks amazing. And I'm, I'm like turning around like this. And I'm like, what, 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 what? and so I put my hand up and I'm like, but there's no keyboard. They're like, no, no, 
we need to compete with Apple. We need to go with no keyboard. And in my mind, I'm like, well, we're trying to secure our base right now. Forget getting new users. Let's stop the hemorrhaging. And one of the main reasons why people are still sticking with the BlackBerry is because of that keyboard. So let's launch our first phone on BB10 with the keyboard. And yes, the second one, let's do it without a keyboard. Fine, but let's secure a base. And so, uh, but the decision had been made already at different levels that I'm involved with. And so the first phone was launched without the keyboard and what the media and the press say, where the hell is the keyboard? Yeah, yeah in fact, in fact, and I remember, I mean, I was die hard BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. And I had come from the Palm 7, which I, if you remember, had an antenna. It was the first yeah. thing you could actually get email on. And when I saw the new BlackBerry and they came out, which was very clear now that you've told the story, which I'm really grateful for you sharing, was, was their thought process. My thought process is exactly what you said, which was, I like BlackBerry because of the keyboard. It was very clear to anybody who had any sense that the UI was nowhere near what the iPhone, even at that time, was. Mm -hmm. And then they come out with this stupid looking clone. I'm like, well, why wouldn't I just go to the better interface at that point? Yeah. So you were absolutely right. And I never understood it. It was very sad to me, to be honest. And I look, I love my iPhone. But if BlackBerry had gone the route that you did, which was upgrade the iOS, have a little better experience, you still could have done touch and had the keyboard. Uh, we I would had a better need. chance of securing our base, right? Yeah, that was, that's, key, that's a key strategy that yeah. shouldn't be underestimated. It wasn't new acquisitions. It was keep what you have. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing I think... Um, could have been done differently is that new phone and that new OS was perceived that we needed to launch it with all the features that the existing BBOS phone had, the one that was in market. So that created delays over delays over delays over delays because there's a lot in there, years and years of development. And so you're trying to take everything as opposed to saying, what are the key things that we need to do? put it on this new thing with the keyboard, new experience, you could have released a bit sooner and then iterate and improve it. But at least the, the customers are getting something in their hand and they can see the constant improvements to it. But, but then, you know, it's easy to be a backbench coach <laughs> or a, what's well, it called? Now? I, I, I don't think you're being a backseat coach right now. I think you're saying I spoke up, they said no, and I fell in line and we had to go that route. But, it, you know, that is a strategy that is, worth keeping in your back pocket for any, any mm -hmm. company. Uh, it's something that it happened at America online when I was there and luckily sort of fell back, but that's a story for another day. Mark the, so you sell Tongle, your wife's pregnant, all the timing's right. You make some money. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this retirement money just for context? Enough to, to secure my family where I don't necessarily need to work but I can't get a jet <laughs> yeah, right. fly yeah, around yeah. the world. You, you, you and I are the same token. That's why I'm, I'm probably you, maybe not. Yeah. I'm back at the plate. I saw this new G850 and it's sick. So, <laughs> um, so I, I wouldn't lie. You know, I'm very grateful for what I have and I'm completely content, but there's always that, that goal. So you, you stay at BlackBerry for two years. Um, I know that there's some stuff in between and maybe you could summarize that because I want to get the block because now mm -hmm. that we've talked mm -hmm. and here's an interesting thing, Mark. So we have a mutual friend who I actually think is an investor in your current oh, company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at Ottawa. And um, when he introduced me to you, this is the first time I actually figured out what you were doing. And when you said you had earlier in the conversation, you said, oh, well, we were, we were the modern day calendar, calendarly or. Mm -hmm. that yeah and i was like i was like what that's not even so code had told me back then he's like look this guy mark he's up there in canada he's doing this calendar thing he's mining all the data out of the calendar he can recommend restaurants and he's doing all this stuff and what's interesting is perceptions of how people describe it when at the fundamental thing you were allowing people to schedule stuff on other people's calendar 
which you didn't even need the fancy stuff <laughs> because just the ability for me to say, Hey, Mark, <laughs> here, here's, it seems trivial now for people and younger people listening like, God, these guys are old, but back then you, you couldn't do that, man. You, you couldn't do that. So that no, was, absolutely not. That, and I think the lesson still to this day is that technology people of which code is one and he is very smart and, and people like you and I who are technology geeks or whatever you want to call it, sometimes over engineer the core problem, mm -hmm. which could be solved by just, Hey, just, get a, grab a block of time on my calendar. So uh, mm -hmm. I just, I just find that interesting because we have that person in common. So you do, you do Tongle, you sell it, your wife's pregnant, you work at BlackBerry, have a good, well, I don't know if it's good or bad, but yeah. interesting experience where you learn some lessons. Oh, really good. And, and smart and, people. Yeah. And what I'm, what I'm, uh, and then I'll let you talk here is I now see how you got to block because of the PIM. Mm -hmm. You start with email, mm -hmm. calendar, and now block, I'm going to give you a slow pitch, which there was probably some things in between, but is smart notes. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So when, um, when we're looking at, um, so, so after, after selling to Blackberry, he took a year off, blah, 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 did a, and do, did a few angel investments, uh, and then joined one of the companies that I invested in. I'm a really bad investor because when I invest, I get really invested in the company and uh ended up joining um that they were just the two founders i was like the number three in the company and then um we did a good run there uh, a company called foco it was supposed to be an instagram for business but we ended up pivoting building a communication and, and task management platform for retailers so we had companies like whole foods uh, converse uh, cvs using our platform uh, sold it in 2021 long story short that. Did you make a lot of money on that one? That one was good as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're compounding good money. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, but also had a really great team, great experience. It was fun. Great investors around the table, made sure we got alignment. Bob was on that board. Uh, by the way, his name, is, I did have a Bob on the board, but it was not Bob. Uh, <laughs> How long did that one take, Mark? <laughs> How uh, long did it take? Uh, so from 2014 to 2021. So, so, so do you feel, I feel like my career goes in the, in these startups are like seven year things. Do yeah. you feel like that that's sort of the number that by the time you figure shit out and actually can get revenue? Yeah. Well, I mean, revenue came earlier, but until we built something that was interestingly interesting enough for someone to acquire us. Um, yeah. So, um, and then the market conditions where they were, where I was like, you know, you, you, to me, you never time starting a company. You start when it makes sense uh, for you and for the idea you've got, but you can time the exit. And the market conditions were, were, were crazy. Um, um, and we, I was seeing in our space that there was going to be consolidation. I was too small to become the consolidator. Uh, so we started a process and it was a really interesting first time I run a process actually for an exit. And, uh, we ended up getting a bit in more and, uh, we sold, uh, in 2021. Um, so wow, that's, not, that's not that long ago. No, no. So what you, like, you're, so this is a real, like you're back at the plate already with mm -hmm. block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and some of the core team members that were part of both Tungle and Foco, uh, are, are part of blocks. Um, and I'm really humbled to be working with them again and trying to build this thing. And we've got this DNA where we've been in the productivity collaboration, um, space, uh, for quite some time. So, uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but we also see some, some areas where there needs to be a lot of improvement. And when I was working on PIM at BlackBerry, again, counter contacts, ask a memo. Our email team was about, the, the, the team working on email client and stuff was about 50, 60 people. The calendar was maybe 40 people, 30 people. The um, contacts was another 20, 30. And if you looked at task and memos, which is notes, had three people, right? Like just how the importance of those things were. But now I think things are, needs to change. 
because when you think about your notes, we are spread so wide around everything. Like we're, we're, we have email, we have Slack, we have uh, WhatsApp, we have all these tools everywhere and we're getting bombarded with information and all this stuff needs to kind of come together somewhere. And when I'm talking about these stuff, I'm talking about short notes, short thoughts, short. I'm not talking about like writing a, a notion page or project of some sort. I'm talking about these brain farts that you have where you're getting these ideas and you need to jot them down. Or it's like, oh, I need to remember to talk to Bob about this. And I need to remember to do this. You're writing these things down or you're putting them in some notes everywhere and you're spread everywhere. And to me, this is part of what's causing chaos in our life. And I've always had this need to be able to think clearly. It's a personal need where you want to get rid of all the noise and what are the, the two or three things that I really need to focus on right now to really have an impact. And so that is where the genesis of blocks really started, which is how do you quickly capture, make it easy to quickly capture all of these blocks of information that you're getting everywhere into a note taking app and you can take your own notes, but then how do you take them and have context kind of created for you. So you don't need to figure out how all of these little blocks of information um, need to be associated with each other. And then when you actually need them, surface that information so I'm better prepared for a meeting I'm about to have, a place I'm about to go, um, something I'm working on. Let me get all of these little blocks of information together so that it makes sense and then I can then build something out of there. So that's kind of the genesis of what we're trying to do here at Blocks. I don't disagree with you when you were talking about it. I've tried and I've been in the sort of, I mean, I was in the consumer space, my first company that I sold, and then I've been in some software development, but CRM space, like mm -hmm. all the things that you're saying. I haven't, I, when Code and I met, not met, well, we, we started a company that basically aggregated all your messages into one stream. Mm -hmm. And, and, and because you know, it's all about this space that we're talking about here. It's email, calendar, notes, and notes are a disaster. And I have struggled for a long time. And when you were saying that, you're like, oh, it's all over. I'm like, no, I got my shit together, Mark. Well, I got news for you. So I do use, and I'm going to try blocks. I've got Apple Notes mm -hmm. only because it's available, mm -hmm. but it still requires human organization, mm -hmm. which is now... Everything that you start, Mark, like when they came out with, I'm interested in your thoughts. When they came out with Slack, everybody's like, it's the best thing. It's organized. I'm like, it's, and everybody craps on email, but here's the issue. Anything new is easy to find stuff. I don't care what it is. Like, yeah, Slack is good for the first like two weeks with a team of maybe 15, 20 developers. And then I still can't find the message. I can't find the file. I can't find that note quote unquote air quotes mm -hmm. for those who aren't watching. Like it's a real disaster. You can tell I'm super passionate about it. But so I tried to come up with this system and then I was on my way out to ride my bike the other day and there's an envelope, the back of a piece of mail sitting next to where I eat at the kitchen counter with the 22 things that I needed to do, mm -hmm. of which have not made it onto the calendar, have not made it into my notes, have not made it into my task list nor have they made it into this other, it's like, so this is a, a big issue and you, this is not the first time it's been tried. How are, are you using some sort of machine learning type concept? And I hate the word AI because AI for listeners, like mm. it's not magic. You have to train these models. This yep. is not, it's not thinking on its own. I mean, eventually maybe, but not right now. Mm -hmm. So how are you, how is blocks you've described it where I feel like I could put all these little notes into a block and then somehow it associates it together either by date, person, company, mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. So, so the first part is the ability to quick capture those things. Okay. So, um, traditionally notes are thought about stuff you write down, but notes today are not only that they they are that, but they are photos there is voice, there could be a bit of video in there. So there's a lot of different media types when we think their websites, their whatever, right? 
components of websites. So the first is the ability to quickly capture these things. Then it's a, the ability to associate them. And what we do is, one is you can look at the content within those notes to try to create links between them. You know, there's a note that talks about this conference and then there's a website that is that conference. And then there's an email that comes in that has a bit of that. You can start associating that thing together. But what we do on top of that is not just look at content within the notes, but we start using information from your other systems, other systems being your calendar, other systems being your email, other systems could eventually be your CRM, could be other sorts of things that you can start understanding the context in which you are actually in. So for example, if our calendar knows that we were meeting today, all right, well, that's context. All the email exchange that we had a couple of weeks ago probably was to lead to this call that we were having on. Yesterday or a couple of days ago, you sent me an email with some, some information, some links, some videos, some all that stuff. That's context. I probably took some notes down to prepare myself for this call because I was listening to some of your podcasts and, and so I was taking some notes down. Well, now we're about to have this call. Well, this morning, well, all this information is surfaced for me in context because it knows that we're about to meet, right? Now it created all these links because it used calendar data to start to link information. It leveraged information from my email and leveraged my notes, but it all created that context for me automatically. Uh, so think of a sales scenario, right? You're working on a deal. Well, you can start seeing all this progress that you're having on a deal, the email exchange, the phone calls, you know, the more we start bringing in different data types and this stuff, the more rich it can become uh, because we're using some levers to understand context of you. Yeah, I love that because basically what you described sounds like Blocks did for you. I did manually this morning. I mean, I, I, I knew you. I got yeah. that in my head, but I went, I opened up some tabs. There's actually a tab right here. I've got some notes on a sticky quote unquote little post-it that Apple has over there. Mm -hmm. And then I've got notes on my thing and you're saying Blocks can bring that all together into a spot at the moment. When you need it. You're actually when you need it. Yeah, that's really, yeah. that's really cool. Um, do you have a challenge hooking the API? This is going to get a little nerdy for people, but I, I can't help but ask because you have to, you have to hook up to multiple systems. Like did it grab the LinkedIn information that you and I exchanged? Cause we've had comms over mm -hmm. two, three, two or three channels. Mm -hmm. So we didn't yet do the LinkedIn stuff. It's, it's on our to do. Um, we, we've already looked into it. We know we can do it. Um, so today, what we started with are probably the, the most data rich environments, which are your, your email and your calendar, uh, Slack, um, um, you know, calendar Slacks. And then in there, you put all the attachments and the, uh, documents as well. Uh, so those are, that's where we start to grab data. And then with time, we're adding other sources of information to, to make it richer and more contextualized. That's that's really cool. So you're, when you sold that other company, did you have this in your head? Because that was 2021 It's 2000. Well, you had 2022. We're just starting 2023. It was a quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sold in 2021. I stayed with our acquirer for a year. Um, and so it's only in 2022 that, you know, blocks really was germinating. Um, the core team, though, that started blocks uh, started without me, um, you know, because they we were acquired. They had left a little bit before the acquisition. They had started a little bit, uh, and then I joined uh, the team uh, after the one year period that I was with uh, our acquire. Um, and so, I was an advisor to the company, and so we were in a lot of conversations of where the market is going, where we're going. Initially, we're actually looking, like I said, every startup that I had never end up being what it is. Uh, initially, it was really looking at the hybrid world um, where people are working from home, they're working from the office, and it was about figuring out when is it the best time for me to come to the office to work with my colleagues. Uh, and so we, so, so the team built a calendar app that was launched on Product Hunt and did really, really well. Um, but then when, we, when they were looking at the next uh, phase of innovation, it was about saying, well, 
you know, one of the bigger challenges, how do you manage your notes when you're, you're look when you're taking, when you're in meetings and then from there, um, and that's about the time when I joined, we're starting to look at first principle and we're saying, well, really when you take notes, it's not only in meetings, you're taking notes all the time and notes are different things. So if we're going to really start doubling down on notes, let's really build something that makes sense. And we start to look at the market. Evernote was being acquired and, and I, I don't like, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with a lot of direction of some of the startups in the note space. I think it could be very different. And so we saw that there was a really good opportunity for us. So, Hey, let's double down and become a full note, note, intelligent note taking app. Well, I think that there's definitely uh, opportunity there and th we just described the problem, just getting together to, to, to record this podcast. So mm -hmm. um, that's a complicated thing. How do you intend to, this is a very, I'm trying to figure out how I benefit from your notes, mainly to try to figure out how you're going to market this, because this sounds like you're going to have to either do an enterprise sale, or if you're in the SMB market, there, is there a virality to this, or is it going to be a direct sale sort of um yeah, so our, our approach, and we need to keep on working at it and, and testing it out, is bottom-up. So get users to want to start using it uh, within a corporation. And as they start using it, they start valuing, seeing the value of it. They tell their colleagues about it. They may want to share some of the context and notes that they are taking with their colleagues. And then from there, it should grow within the organization. Um, that's what we're betting on. So you are direct marketing to individuals through Correct. content, through ads, through whatever. And does it require an app download? Yeah. So today we made the strategic decision to, uh, to be desktop on Mac. Uh, and then we have iOS and Android app. So we do not have a web version because we believe that the experience of note taking needs to be really close to you all the time. Hence why we're on the desktop. We didn't yet uh, release a Windows version. Um, the other thing, uh, from a startup standpoint, we wanted to limit the platforms that we support. So today we just support the Google workspace environment. Uh, soon we'll look at adding office 365, but we really wanted to do a good job at the Mac and Google workspace environment before starting to branch out to other environments. Have you had any security issues because you obviously are touching what a lot of people consider mm -hmm. privacy. That's really been a roadblock for me and all these productivity tools quite, quite candidly is the privacy issue. Yeah. So for us, that's front and center for us. Like we want to make sure that people feel safe when they're using our application. So we did a few strategic decisions from a technical standpoint to put people at ease on it. First, obviously everything is encrypted um, everywhere at rest and in transit. But when it comes to email and calendar data, we do not store anything. We actually go and, and search and fetch. We have some really fancy algorithms that go and try to fetch the information, get the results really quickly for what we're trying to find. Um, and then we surface it to the user in terms of the stuff. And if they click on it, then we go and, and bring up the content of that one email that they're really interested in, for example. Um, but we don't store anything on our servers. So, so you don't store any type of any, except the note. We you store the note. Use in blocks. We store the note. We store your profile information and yeah. that sort of stuff. But in terms of core, um, core um, data from emails, and, and we don't store any of that. Well, I appreciate this. Is really for listeners are probably like, "Wow, you're losing me now, guys." But uh, I couldn't help but ask, is uh, because these are some of the challenges technically that that these types of apps across platforms always. Based, but I love the idea, Mark. Uh, I I'm so grateful to have the conversation with you and get to know you more. And I now know where all this came from, and I know in a second why Code was super interested in this because this is just you know I think there's evolving. There's always going to be an opportunity in this space. And to your point, like Notes, even at BlackBerry, had the smallest team, but possibly is one of the most important things, at least equal to email and well that's and what this. i think that you know the note taking app is always the uh, the uh, sick child where nobody invests in it um i think that it 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 needs to take its place right now um 
as equal to email and calendar. Um, because I think with all the application we're using, it's so fundamental to keeping us in check. Yeah, I think there's a, a huge opportunity, but the, the shiny object and the most used may have been, but maybe people would use notes more if the damn thing worked right. That's true. Which <laughs> comes, comes blocks, which is you come out with something that works, it's going to change the game. So I, I'm really excited for you on that. And I'm grateful for you taking the time out of your day building this thing to to talk with us at the end of every show, I always ask this and I think I prepared you for it, which is you only get to give three pieces of advice from all these years you've done. You've had uh, what one, two, three acquisitions so far. Mm -hmm. You've worked at a big company. You've raised money. You've bootstrapped them in the beginning. If you only had to give fellow listeners, business owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, three pieces of advice, what are they? You know, I wish I would be super original but I'm not, but, um, first, um, it, it's first focus on who you want to work with is probably more important than what you work on. Um, um, surrounding yourself with the strongest people surrounding yourself with people you enjoy spending your time with is probably the most important part. So that is the first one. Second, um, and proof in point, every startup that I've had has always end, started somewhere, ended up somewhere else. Uh, iterate, 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 change your mind, change direction. Don't be afraid. Sunk cost. Forget what is in the past and where you invested your time. Focus on what's the best investment moving forward. Um, so, so that's the second one. And then third, just be nice. <laughs> just be nice, uh, to people. Um, you live once you want to be remembered for being a nice person, not an asshole. Well, Mark. You know, you said you didn't, you, you wanted to be original. I will tell you that over, I think I've probably done 300 conversations and no one's ever said, just be nice. So there you are most original that you, that you thought, but it, it's one of those things that people take for granted. And I think it's great advice. Just be nice. Like it fixes a lot of shit. Yeah. Um, well, those are, were great. Mark, where can listeners find you and blocks? So uh, blocks.app. B L O K S. So there's no C. So B L O K S dot app. Uh, come, come to our website, uh, sign up for a wait list of people that are already started to use our application. I uh, would love to have your, your feedback on it. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, just find me Mark Jangra for blocks and you'll find me right away. Oh, we'll put all that in the show notes. Mark, thanks a lot, man. This has been a ton of fun. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Bye everyone. Bye.